Um, I've also been working on being more explicitly outcome focused. So thinking about things like how can we map to outcomes or start with outcomes first and then design backwards from that. So basically, when I do this exercise with companies, it's kind of thinking about what's the impact that you wanna have instead of saying like, well, we need an app and we expect the app is going to do this because it's possible that the outcome that you want to achieve can be achieved by other means. Um, this kind of format is simplified, but it's borrowed from essentially some of my um, sort of uh, nonprofit and public sector clients who use tools like theory of change. So borrowing from this to add to the design practice I think is a really valuable exercise. We can learn from other, um, we, can, we can definitely learn from other disciplines and apply it to our own work. So I started, even though we've been doing this with um, tools that are directly related to products and product design, um, I was wondering like, how can we consider the systemic impact of our work? Like what about stakeholders and, uh, and effects that are a few degrees past the users or the context that we're thinking about or the context that our products and services are used? And I know that, um, yeah, many of us, um, as kind of displayed earlier when I asked, we use systems thinking in different ways. So we do things like stakeholder mapping. Um, this was a map that I created for one of our clients who um, you know, has created a public data platform. And what it shows is that even if you're trying to reach citizens, you might need to design for government staff journalists or researchers, and your users are very different than the people who are going to benefit the most from your work. Um, and we also do things like load, um, ecosystem mapping. So this is a series of uh, basically uh, the landscape of hospitals in India. So you have public hospitals to small private hospitals, and sort of the impact on different players within that ecosystem. And then I know many of you have probably done service blueprints, which are their own form of system. Um, what I've been thinking about though, that's kind of like missing from this mix are things that are really specifically around cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And I was, I've been thinking about the Cobra effect, which was something I discovered as like a kid and it's been surfacing for me as I've been doing this work. Does anyone know what the Cobra effect is? Okay, so it's um, basically 19th century British colonial army. They put a bounty on dead cobras that were turned into them because they're trying to reduce the cobra population. And so people started turning in dead cobras um, and the cobra population reduced. And then suddenly they noticed an uptick of the number of dead cobras that people were turning in. Like, wow, there's a lot of cobras that how, how is this happening? And it was because people were breeding cobras to, in order to kill them so that they could turn them in for the bounty, thereby increasing the cobra population, the wild cobra population. So it backfired horribly and it was, it kind of flew in the face of the original intent. And that's because they didn't have a good understanding of how what they were doing would have an impact once, um, once it was out of their control. And also, uh, I think, oh yeah, the French colonial army did this too in Vietnam, trying to get rid of rats. So the same thing happened, where they put a bounty on rats, people turned in rats, they start, people started breeding rats, and the rat population exploded because of this bounty. So I guess like the message is that, you know, colonialism is bad. Um, <laughs> like, because of this, but also you can just stop it. Colonialism is bad. <laughs> um, I had forgotten about that rat example. Um, but I just, I was thinking, of, there was another example just the other day where, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, yeah, Stevens nodding his head. I read about how plastic bag bans actually increase our use of plastic because people were reusing plastic bags to do things like line their garbage bins, pick up dog poop, and now what they do instead is they buy garbage bin liners which use far more plastic, mm -hmm. and so our use of plastic actually increases. Um, so these are the kinds of like causal effects that I find really interesting and I was trying to figure out a way 
to integrate this in our analysis of understanding the context in which products and services happen. So I wanted to think about this. Um, you know, I had like some time and the freedom to do a research project last year, and um, I wanted to think about social media. It's an example of a good, like big, like large ecosystem that has multi-layered impact. And the possibility for causal loops is pretty like broad in terms of like the impact it has on society. So I was thinking about Facebook and their mission statement is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. I just have a feeling a lot of people aren't feeling that right now, <laughs> that they're actually doing a good job of accomplishing their mission statement. So um, with that in mind, um, I did a systems understanding research project to try to understand the impact and to use, um, sorry, it's like, it's supposed to like flow out gently and it's um, <laughs> basically like how social media works. Kind of asking ourselves like, can this kind of system be saved? Like what kind of impact is it having on the world today? And what kinds of interventions could be designed to create a different landscape? Now, um, I, I was kind of like, this is the sort of thing that I could spin out and go to like the edge of the universe and back and spend months doing and never get anywhere. And so I started thinking about like, what's the best way um, to, I don't know, to sort of provide provide me and the researchers that I was working with um, with some constraints. And so we use this framework where the first thing we do is use systems mapping to understand the status quo, use that. So understand like the cascading effects of, um, of what's going on in a system as well as like the symptoms. Then use that to identify root cause or kind of like the deep structure of your systems map. And then use that understanding of root cause to prioritize types of interventions. Now this isn't like a super, like systems thinking is like a super deep and rigorous practice. Um, Danella Meadows kind of wrote the, like the book on systems thinking in the 70s. If you want to think about like stock and flow and feedback loops and how you disrupt them, you can use that as a resource. Um, in my research on this, like I came to understand a lot of that, but I found it just like way, way too technical for what we were doing. So we wanted to kind of simplify the approach a little bit. So I can share some of the ways that we did causal loops. Um, so first, we look at understanding the status quo and to kind of provide ourselves with further constraints. We wanted to understand the impact of social media on individuals, communities, and society. And so there's five layers, and this is taken from the UNICEF um, social ecological model. So um, you have personal effects, interpersonal effects, community, organizational, all the way up to policy and enabling environments. And so we wanted to look at these different layers of impact. And I think it was like, I have a video, but I think it's gonna just like freak it all out right now. Um, so I might actually try and skip it. But basically, we um, what we did, this is actually on the Artifact website as well. This is our space. Like we took it over because we started doing this, and this is um, Gabriel Biller, who's like, just like an amazing design researcher, and we worked together on this for about a month. And we started creating causal loops digitally, and then we were just like, oh my god, screw it, this is like too crazy, like let's just like do it with post-it notes on the wall, yeah. because mm -hmm. then we can like take them down and sort of draw connections between them and stuff. And it just kind of like made it a little bit more like we were totally immersed in this. Like we interviewed um, subject, academic subject matter experts. And at one point I literally had like 298 tabs open on my phone when we were doing the research for this. And I was like, this is an illness, I have to stop. Um, I did that thing, like beautiful thing where you just like hold it down and then everything just goes away and I was like, oh my gosh, I feel free. Um, and so we ended up doing this, uh, yeah, it's gonna be like jittery, but we ended up creating this systems map digitally after we had it kind of all the connections figured out and, um, 
analyzed it by way of those three categories that I talked about before. And I know these things will be a little hard to read, so I'll kind of like read them out to you as we go through them. And uh, you can also, um, I, down, I wrote a white paper about this, so you can download the white paper on our website, the link to it at the end. So if we think about the individual impact, um, there was this article two years ago in The Atlantic written by this researcher, Jean Twang, who does a lot um, in terms of digital impact on teens and young adults. And basically what she did what she deduced was eighth graders who spend 10 hours or more a week on social media are 56% more likely to stay unhappy than those who devote less time to social media. Moreover, when teens have more engagement online and fewer interactions in person, feelings of depression and loneliness increase. And so we found that to be um, consistent with some other research that we are looking at. So we created this causal loop, and when you're creating causal loop, you think about uh, increases and decreases in what's happening. And so to do a cl closed loop, we could start, for example, with time spent on platform reduces the time spent in meat space, well, real life. Um, this, I don't know how meat space has stayed in there so long it was on. I wrote it on a sticky note to be funny, and then like it made it all the way to like our final <laughs> deliverables. Um, but basic, or this, to be more accurate, it's a reduction in time spent cultivating interaction. In mean space. And then that leads to an increase in seeking more online interactions, which leads to an increase of feelings of depression and loneliness, which leads to an increase in time spent on the platform. Um, one of the professors that I spoke to, she said she knew this YouTube engineer who actually quit the company because of their metrics. So he was like, they just keep pushing for more people to watch more videos and longer videos for more, longer amounts of time. And he was just like asking a lot of questions about it and it just seemed like there was nothing else that mattered. And so he um, actually ended up leaving before being able to make any change. Now we did a bunch of these causal loops at the individual level and then we also did them at the community level. So if you think about that framework from earlier, individual, community, and society, um, where'd my causal loop at? Um, so again, we're starting on time spent on the platform, leads to an increase in personal data collection, leads to an increase of the use of proxy data for profiling. Do you guys know what proxy data is? It's like if I live in 98105 and drive a Volvo, it knows that I'm liberal. So um, <laughs> they will use that information to kind of surface more radical content in groups because they can have a better picture of the extreme things that will appeal to you which will lead to the production of and consumption of more sensationalist content, which leads to an increase in time spent on the platform. Now, uh, the YouTube creator Matt Lee told The Guardian in 2018, he said, divisive content is king of online media today because anything that rouses you up and is toxic is when the algorithm loves you most. So um, this, I don't know if you got, so I did a search before I was giving a different talk at IXTA, I was doing the search for vaccines on YouTube, and um, and I just let autoplay run, and I was like, so, I, I can't believe it, I was like actually surprised. After doing all this research, I was still surprised that within 20 minutes, it was like straight up in anti-vaxxer territory. It started out with informational videos like from UCL, UCLA Health, and then it just like was a downward spiral almost instantaneously. View. No matter what you think about anti-vaccination is a very fringe point of view, and it got me there in 20 minutes and five videos. That's, that's really saying something about how um, the recommendation engine works. There was a piece just this Sunday um, in the New York Times where the excellent technology reporter Kevin Roos, he analyzed several years of data from a single YouTube user. I can't remember his name. His last name is Kane, though. Um, and he, he turned over his YouTube history to Kevin Roos, and he basically did an analysis of how he became radicalized online. All of the pink are the right-wing content that he viewed, and all of the purple are the intellectual dark web content that he viewed. And so it just encourages, it brings you further and further out, not because it wants you to become extreme, but because they just want you to spend more time on the platform. It's actually agnostic.